Hello, and welcome to Pivotal Moments, a podcast sharing, exploring, and celebrating stories of change, big or small. We are all agents of change and have the power to pivot at any point, at any time. I'm your host, Melissa Robana, along with my co-host, Sidia Gutierrez. On this episode, we discuss how emotional well-being impacts our physical bodies. We share our own stories of how our bodies tell us something was off and how self-awareness helped us develop stress management tools. On this episode, we wanted to take some time to pause and really talk about the physical effects that a pivot can cause you or can cause your body. Because at this point, you guys have heard about Sabrina's story, you've heard Lee's story, and we've got an upcoming episode that's also going to be talking about the physical things that can happen to the body. So we thought, you know what, while we're in the middle of this theme that has come up, Let's address some of the things that can happen to the body uh, as stress or other things happen when you have a pivot. Well, when you have when you're undergoing a pivot, there's so many emotions at play. Um, I mean, now we we all know that pivots can be good or they can be bad. But so the emotions that you're feeling can be anywhere from fear or anger to happiness and joy, love. But those that are those that are experiencing poor health, um, maybe don't have the correct coping skills. Um, like myself, I was a silent suppressor, silent suffer, I think is what I often say. Mm-hmm. And so by doing that though, by not addressing or participating in activities that promote good emotional health, I was actually becoming more susceptible to colds and infections. And Vince and I actually, he would always joke with me, God, you're sick again. But when, but when your, your body is just such an amazing machine that if one part, even mental, if, if that's off, the rest of your body is thrown out of whack. Absolutely. And so I think that's a huge part of it is knowing our bodies, they want home, homeostasis. They want to be equal. They want everything to be balanced out. Our bodies were designed to do things in a certain way at a certain time. And when there are things that are happening in your life that don't go with the biology, there's going to be effects. There's going to be strong things that are happening to your body. And there's a um, profound book that came out that I know we've kind of touched on uh, before called The Body Keeps the Score. Now, The Body Keeps the Score is a fantastic, fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Uh, What I really like about it, and I came across it during... um, basically during my own therapy and my own healing that I've been going through. And what this book is talking about is how if you are not um, not seeing things or you are seeing certain things that are coming up in your body, um, it's because your body keeps track of everything that has ever happened to you and it keeps reacting to it because your body's main goal is to protect you. Mm -hmm. And it's going to do that however it thinks it needs to do it. Mm-hmm. And so there are certain effects of trauma, of unresolved trauma and other things that will manifest itself in the body. And so some people may not believe that that is something that actually happens. I, I do happen to believe that your body is going to manifest things that are happening. Um, not to say that you bring it on to yourself, but there are symptoms that can happen to your body if you're not addressing your emotional being. Well, and you mentioned earlier that, I mean, look at the interviews that we did with Sabrina and Lee. Sabrina, I mean, Lee, like you had mentioned, I think just in us talking, that he was forced to to stop and slow down and address his, his health because he was physically incapable of being able to do anything else. He had to focus on his recovery. Well, Sabrina was just this thriving journalist and she was trying to just pack her worries, her anxiety of, I don't know, just having cancer into a closet, hoping that it would go away. But eventually it came back with fervor because Mm -hmm. it was like, no, this needs to be addressed. And that's when she decided, okay, I need to put myself first. And this, this work environment, how I'm treating my body is, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. It's physically killing me. Right. And, And I think that's the main thing that if you're not paying attention to yourself and your emotional well-being and um, you know your your wellness your your spiritual self even if you're not doing those things 
your body is going to tell you. And I think we've talked about this a little bit. I can share for me, I was in a very high stress situation for my first job as a baby lawyer. And when I was in that process, I, I gained a ton of weight. Like I was eating like shit. My face was constantly breaking out. Right now I have a couple of breakouts because I was also not eating so good. And I pick up my face, I'm terrible at it. But I was super stressed out. And just these things were, were happening to my body that, uh, that was when I started, well, you know what, I should go see a doctor. So I went to go see my primary care physician. And the first thing she was like, you have to manage your stress. I was like, you don't understand, I'm a lawyer. Like, no, I can't possibly manage my stress. She's like, you have to figure it out. And one of the first prescriptions she gave me was literally a Fitbit. She's like, you have to work on moving. You have to work on doing these things. And at some point she was like, you need to get in therapy. You need to do some cognitive behavioral therapy. And what, what I loved about her was that she was always very blunt. But um, one of the other things that I started doing when I saw her was I realized I was carrying low back pain every single day for over a year. And I didn't know what it was. And I was, okay, I'll get massages. And so I started going to Massage Envy regularly. I, you know, I started walking. I started trying to lose weight. It was like I kept trying to find a physical answer for why do I have this low back pain like I hadn't been in a car accident I hadn't had a slip and fall the things that I usually associate with low back pain I didn't have a history of it and when I'd finally decided that I didn't want to be in this work environment anymore when that clicked in my head and I was like I'm done and I started looking for a new job my back pain went away interesting I have something similar my physical ailment, as I'm sure you know, but listeners, I used to assume that I had a gluten allergen. And so, I, and the reason being is because I was always sick. I was nauseated constantly. Uh, I had low energy. Um, I had, I was operating in a mental fog. I couldn't really put two words together. It probably seems like that now, but no, I promise you, it's <laughs> only because we're drinking some mimosas. But, you know, so... The first thing that my doctor asked was, okay, well, what is it that you're eating? So we, I did all these tests, blood work, came back that I wasn't allergic to anything. But she's like, you know, keep a food diary. Just because you're not allergic doesn't mean you don't have some sort of sensitivity. So again, I go back and I'm journaling everything that I'm, I'm eating and, you know, writing down how I feel afterwards. But still, like, it, it just, it wasn't, sometimes I, I would experience flare-ups. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Like I'm eating a clean diet. This shouldn't be happening. Ran more tests, had MRIs done, come to find out it was IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And that is a, a result of not being able to manage my stress. Mm -hmm. And so the doctor was like, okay, we've been able to safely conclude what it's not, but here, here's really the only option of what it is. And so the prescription basically is looking at bettering your emotional health, which requires counseling. So I went back to counseling and I have to say, by improving my emotional health, the symptoms of IBS, not to say that I don't have flare-ups, right? Because, you know, maybe I have a deadline for a project or get overwhelmed with life, you know, COVID, that sort of thing. So it's not to say that I don't have flare-ups, but it just goes to show the power that your emotional health, your well-being has over your body. It really does. It has a huge impact on on your physical self. And I think that, you know, doctors are trying. And I appreciated so much having that first primary care physician because she was just, she was on it. She, she was had, no bullshit. Oh, she was not a bullshitter at all. And when I started doing things like managing my stress, it made it easier to lose weight. It made it easier to start having a regular exercise routine. And she wasn't recommending anything that was bad for me or impossible, but I was just, oh, you know, I can't possibly do this because my job is so, you know, whatever. When, when I used to think that it was very important, um, it's still important, but in a different way. I don't think of it the same way. And just knowing, hey, my body tells me, and if I'm listening, and if you're listening to your body, what is it telling you? So what do you, what would you say, uh, resembles good emotional health. For me, I would think it would be self-awareness. That is key. Self-awareness is always up there. I think for me, it's how quickly can I get myself 
out of a funk? I was going to say also developing resilience. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's huge. Have you heard of the work of Barbara Fredrickson? I have not. So Barbara Fredrickson is a psychology professor. Um, the only way that I know her is because she operates in the branch of positive psychology and appreciative inquiry is just right there. So she's most known for her broaden and build theory of positive emotion and how it actually can, can contribute to our resilience, well-being, and health. And she posits that by experiencing positive emotions, it broadens our minds and builds our resourcefulness that help us become more resilient when experiencing hardships. And so she, she did a lot of research into, well, what is considered a positive emotion? And it reminded me of a previous episode that we did where we talked about like catch-all phrases. And I think we talked about frustration is typically a catch-all phrase. Anger is typically a catch-all phrase. So when we think of positive emotions, I think people think like, oh, well, that just means I have to be happy. And positive emotion is so much more than that, if you really think about it, because that can include uh, gratitude, love, joy, awe, inspiration. And so how often do we miss these small moments of goodness that happen all around us because we're not open to these positive emotions or maybe even seeing that these are positive emotions. Mm -hmm. So her research really delves into, well, how, how much positive emotion do you need to experience in order to reap the benefits? And she talks a lot of science jargon, but basically you need three positive emotions to one negative emotion. And so three to one, three to one. And so you can't, some people are probably listening. Well, why can't you just reduce it to zero? Uh, don't you want to have zero negative emotions? But that's, think about it. That's not realistic. It's impossible, right? Um, I watched a video of hers and she was talking about that you can't fake being happy, right? Eventually, one, it comes across as fake, but then two, have you ever tried to put on a brave face for someone or people? What happens? It, for me personally, it, it's draining and I might be resentful or why am I not happy? Like I have all these things going for me. So, um, what... I think, especially working in the field of appreciative inquiry, I often get clients saying, because I work under positive psychology, that it's like, oh, well, you're ignoring, you're ignoring the negative emotions or bad things that happen in life. But actually, that's not true because emotions can be, ex they're not independent of one another. Rather, they can be experienced at the same time. And so one, one example that kind of comes to mind for me is when I underwent surgery. And so when I was about to undergo um, my partial hysterectomy, you know, I was experiencing anxiety and stress and fear. Um, but I also, um, now at this point in time, I was actively practicing gratitude exercises. So I was able to also notice that my mom flew out from California to take care of me while I recovered. My husband cooked and took care of the house. Um, friends reached out to kind of just check in to see how I was doing. And those moments of appreciation and gratitude and thankfulness, I experienced all those emotions at the same time. So it's possible. But it was because I had a higher positivity ratio that it allowed me to, yeah, I can experience those negative emotions, but I'm not wallowing in it. And I'm able to kind of build that resilience up so that I can experience it and then move on. Mm -hmm. And this is also a good way to measure whether or not it's time for you to move on from something like a relationship, maybe a job, if you're having more of the negative and you're out of balance in that way, that that's definitely something that can help cue you into there's something off here. Uh, but before we go too much further, listeners, I know Melissa just dropped a bomb on you that she had a hysterectomy. We are going to talk about this. <laughs> we are going to get into it. It is its whole new it's an episode on its own and it is coming, let me tell you. So I just want to make sure you knew that. Oh, absolutely. And, but coming back to Barbara's research, you can actually visit, she created a whole new website. She wrote a book on it because, you know, if you do something, you got to write a book. It's actually, I think it's called positivityratio.com. And you can go and actually take the free ratio test to see where you are. And what's nice, I haven't done it in a long time. Um, but at this point I was practicing gratitude. So my ratio was pretty high, 
but it's nice to kind of see and check in every periodically where am I at? Do I need to do more to look at the good that's happening around me or am I doing well? If I'm feeling off, kind of like just looking at what's happening in my life that I might need to to modify. So this is just another great tool to kind of just almost like checking in with yourself. Are, are there things that you've experienced where you're paying attention to your body um, or like you with your IBS? If you're like, oh, something's going on here. Like, well, what are those things that are cueing you in? I definitely listen to my body. I think counseling has really helped me and this podcast has really helped me become more aware because if I'm feeling off, your body is constantly sending you signals. It's constantly telling you, you know, something's wrong or anticipation. Because sometimes, you know, I, I don't know if you experience this. I'm, I'm assuming people do. But sometimes I'm like, I woke up and I'm like, I just feel off. I don't know what that off is. And, you know, you can choose to ignore and just be like, you know what? Fuck it. It's an off day. But I want to know because I don't want it to linger. So what's going on that maybe I need to address? And it could be subconscious. And yes, people are entitled to off days. Mm -hmm. But I just know that for me, my energy level, that is the biggest thing that I notice is my energy level. I will be like, fuck it. I don't want to go for a walk. I don't want to go outside. I don't want to interact with my dog. I don't want to work. Mm -hmm. Like when I find that I don't have energy and I want to start to isolate myself, that's when I know something is below the surface. What about you? I, I really like what you just said about the energy level because when you're looking at it, if you can't find a physical reason for your ailment. So um, this year I was starting to experience like just some weird neck pain and other things with stress. Like, like my doctor, new primary care physician, not as direct as my first, but still very good. Um, and so I was just having like these weird neck pains and I would just notice... Um, these impingements and just like radiating down my arms when I'm in certain positions and other things. And we, we did the workup and yeah, you know, I'm, you know, surprise, surprise, I'm fucking old. Like there's, there's some of those things that came out, just basic, um, basic degeneration that you would expect to have that happens with aging. Mm -hmm. But what was really interesting was then I was talking to my counselor about it. She's like, well, you got to look at it this way. If you go through the whole workup for the physical and you can't find a physical medical reason for this, then you have to start thinking about the emotional. What's going on emotionally in your world because those symptoms are indicative of something going on. And if you can't find the medicine, what else is it? And I was like, oh, you're right. And I was experiencing different kinds of stress. I had gotten away from some of my self-care routines. Um... I had gotten away from this um, amazing vocal warm-up that my vocal coach did for me. And for a while there, I was doing it daily and I was doing it at work and I didn't care that, you know, I'm making these fucking, you know, weird noises in my office. But then we got into this new space and I, I wasn't doing that anymore. And I quickly realized, oh, there were a bunch of little things that I was doing for myself that I let go of. And now my body's telling me, hey, why don't you go back to just like, you know, little things where it was just like massaging my neck for a little bit because, you know, I could, you know, do some neck massage items to help with my voice and to help with, you know, the recordings and do things like that. Um, but it was just amazing that I didn't make that connection until it was, okay, well, let's talk about this emotional stuff that is showing itself physically. It, I, I really like the point that you talked about, okay, well, if there's nothing physical going on, we have to look at the emotional, but think about when there is a physical ailment, what do we do? The doctors prescribe us medicine and we're quick to take that because we don't want to feel that discomfort. What stops us from having to put in the work to help fix that emotional? I mean, because I think that that's what's, that stops a lot of people because, you know, I think it's easy for people, I guess it's, it really just surmounts to how much time, how much effort am I willing to put into, to, to make these changes? Because emotional changes, in my opinion, in my experience, are harder. Like, it's easier for me to pick up a, a workout routine. Okay, cool, I'm gonna take my dog for a walk every morning. Great. Now, if it comes to, oh shit, I have a counseling appointment. Mm, maybe I'll reschedule that, but why? Why? Mm -hmm. And I think we talked about this before um, off air, which is about being selfish. Right. And this, again, is going to be another episode because I'm just so fascinated by it. But it's 
you know, we have this preconceived notion that being selfish is a negative thing, but if we're not focusing on our needs and our wants, who is? Mm -hmm. So I think that it's okay to be selfish. And I think that that also pertains to emotional well-being. We all want to be well. We all want to thrive. We all want to succeed. And that requires our full self to be there. That includes our emotional health. Yeah, our emotional health is a big part of it. And I think just taking time to realize your body is so incredibly smart. And your body is built to keep you alive and to keep you going. And that's the job. So when things start going wrong in your body, yes, yeah, some of it is going to be age related, but there might be some other things. And in fact, some things may happen sooner because you're not dealing with your shit and, you know, or you're carrying too much baggage, emotional baggage, and that is going to affect you physically. I'm telling you, the minute that I decided I'm not dealing with this bullshit anymore, my back pain went away. And when I notice certain stiffness or other things, it clues me into, oh, okay, what, what's going on here? Like there, there's something else. Sometimes it is just, you know, I overdid it and that's okay. But other times there's something that's going on that I'm not addressing or I'm avoiding. It's like, well, why am I avoiding those things? Well, and I'll share the story because I don't think my dad will listen to this podcast. I say that I would be like, Mel, what were you talking about? Okay, so... My father has been taking Ambien. And for those that may not know, Ambien is this sleeping medication that's supposed to help those that have difficulty sleeping. I had no idea he'd been taking it as long as he had, but he's been taking it for, I'm going to say, over 10 years. And so um, start off with him taking one pill. And then, you know, then he's found that he was like getting up in the middle of the night and he would have to take a second Ambien. Now, Ambien is freaking strong as hell really strong. I mean, it like knocks people out, but my dad seems to, um, Isn't it like a tolerance? super dose of like melatonin? It's something. I mean, I saw him on it one time. He, he took it right before bed and he was stumbling almost at it if he had been drinking. So it's a very strong drug. I want to say it's a narcotic, but I'm not hundred percent sure. But my point being is that, you know, my father has a lot of atonement, a, a lot of things he should atone for, I should say. Um, a lot of ghosts of his past that I don't think that he has addressed. And I think that it's the ghosts of his past that keep him up at night. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, he, he tells me all the time how tired he is and stuff like that. And I, I, I truly believe this. I truly believe that until he really has addresses these issues and has these really difficult conversations with himself and perhaps others that he's, he's pained, mm -hmm. will then will he be able to actually sleep through the night without Ambien. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you brought up sleep though, because sleep is also a huge indicator of how you're, how you're doing. And you know what? We're, we're going through the seasons. There's times of the year where your body needs more sleep. Why are you pushing it? Why are you ignoring it? I'm giving myself more sleep right now in winter because damn it, that's what my body wants. It's not because it's getting dark at like two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that has a little bit to do with it, but that's part of us having these, these natural rhythms and understanding that our rhythms are going to change with time, but they also get affected by our, our emotional well-being. So mm -hmm. if you're all of a sudden becoming an insomniac and you know, I can say for myself, I would definitely have periods of time where it's those 3 a.m. thoughts and it'd be 3 a.m. all the time. Uh, me yes. too. And, and like they would just keep going and keep me up and all of a sudden it's like here's all the shit you're forgetting at 3 a.m it's like I need to sleep and at some point I finally told myself I was like I know brain brain I know you are just trying to protect me from some of these things that are going on I appreciate it but I can't write it down right now and I need to go back to sleep let's talk about it in well the and, and I think it's also finding tools so yes I'm doing mm -hmm. what I can I have the podcast that has served as like catalyst to kind of help work through some stuff I'm mm -hmm. going to counseling but it's also finding tools that work for you so for a while I actually had because I was waking up between two and three with like oh my god did you send that email out to so and so and oh my mm -hmm. god don't forget you have to you have that meeting tomorrow at seven o'clock and I'm like do we have to do this right now so I actually kept a notepad by me and that, mm. that seemed to help slightly, but mm. you know, um, I, I definitely agree with that technique at this point. Um, I was, I didn't have it easily accessible to me 
And so what I started doing actually was I started doing a practice called morning papers. And morning papers is something from the artist's way. And in there, basically, the first thing you do in the morning is you write down everything that comes to your mind. So like before I'd go on my morning walk, that's what I would do. And I almost filled out a full journal on it. And it was just three pages that you write. And it does. It could be a list. It could be your thoughts. It could be random shit. It just, there's no right or wrong way to do this. And I was doing that for a really long time. And then, then I got sick back in November with, with COVID. And my body was just physically not feeling up to it. So I'm hoping that by this, by the time this drops, I'll get back into that routine. Right now I've let it go. And also knowing there are things that are going to help you just because they're helping you doesn't mean you have to stick to them all the time. But if you start noticing things slipping, you bring them back in. Well, and that, okay. So that's a good point because, you know, when I was writing stuff down at three o'clock in the morning, that really is still a symptom to something bigger at play. And mm -hmm. it was still causing me to wake up. And so that really wasn't helping me sleep any better. I was still waking up at three because now I've just told my body it was okay to wake up so I can drop shit down. But what I've started doing, what has helped me actually sleep through the night is listening to an audiobook. Because my mind, being type A perfectionist OCD, I have my my mind is constantly firing things at me that it's hard to shut my mind off. Like when people talk about meditation, how they're one with their body, kudos to you. I, I've tried to practice meditate, you know, meditate several times. I cannot shut off my mind at all. Well, so that's not necessarily the point of meditation. But I mean, people are talking about, you know, um, focusing on your breath. I can never do that. But coming back to the point was, you know, allowing or listening to audiobooks before bed. I'm focusing on the story. I'm not focusing on the email that I have to send tomorrow. I'm not focusing on, you know, the, mm -hmm. the meeting. Am I prepared for it? You know, all of that. I'm just listening to the book. And that has allowed me to get in a deeper, more peaceful sleep. So again, it's just finding things that work for you. And if mm -hmm. it doesn't work for you, keep, keep trying. But again, it comes back to that emotional health, that self-awareness and, and just really building that resiliency with that positive, that positive emotion, looking at all the good things that are happening around you and, you know, using that to kind of help propel you when you're dealing with some shit. We want to hear from you. What stress management tools and tips do you have to share? Let us know in our private Facebook group, Pivotal Moments HQ. We want to thank our producer and music director, Ron Johnson. This has been an Astronomicus DMR production. Thank you for listening. Remember, it's never too late and you're right on time.